Hello, everyone. Welcome to, today, to today's event, Research Funding as a Mechanism to Advance Gender Equity. My name is Lisa Williams. I'm an Associate Professor in the School of Psychology and also Associate Dean Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at UNSW Sydney. I'm also Chief Investigator on the grants that fund the Office for the Women in Australia's Women in STEM Ambassador. I'll be your MC for today, and I'm delighted that so many of you are able to join us in person and to the more than 200 of you that we're set to have online. To ensure that everyone feels included here, I'd like to provide a brief description of myself. I'm standing to my right of the stage at a podium. I am wearing a striped shirt and a blue cardigan, and I have brown hair and am fairly tall. All right, if you have any questions or need any assistance for those of you in the room, um, please don't hesitate to reach out one of our team members sitting in the back of the room. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to note that today's session is being recorded and there will be a recording available online uh, after the event. Today we're meeting on the ancestral lands of the Gadigal people. It is with deep respect and gratitude that we begin our event today with a welcome to country. I'm honored to introduce our esteemed speaker, Savannah Finn, to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Savannah Finn, and I'm a proud Wiradjuri woman from Dubbo, New South Wales. I'm currently studying a Bachelor of Social Work at the University of Wollongong, while also working with the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Lands Council going out to sacred sites with you and making sure they maintain an untouch. I'm a representative of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Lands Council and have the cultural authority and endorsements under the Aboriginal Lands Rights Act for the land we meet on today. I would like to pay my respects to all elders, past, present and emerging and extend that respect to you all here with me today. Traditional owners are not defined by hands or by a pen, but through the natural landscapes of the earth, that being Mother Earth. The nation's country covers the Horsebury to the north, the Nepean to the west, and the Georges River to the south. A welcome to country is more than just words, it is a spiritual process. So on behalf of the Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Lands Council board, members and elders, I would like to welcome you all to the land of the Gadigal people of the Euro Nation and extend that respect to all your viewers from all the lands you are meeting from today. Welcome, 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 and thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Savannah. Um, I'd also like to respectfully acknowledge past and president to, uh, present, sorry, traditional custodians of this land. Um, it's a privilege to be standing on country. And I thank you again, Savannah, for your warm welcome to country. The Australian government's Women in STEM ambassador, WISA, together with Science in Australia Gender Equity, SAGE, are hosting this event. Today we'll be discussing our recently released WISA research on gender differences in 20 years of Australian awarded research grants. These two organizations, WISA and SAGE, share a mission to support gender equity, diversity and inclusion, and provide recommendations for higher education and research institutions to take action to remove barriers to women's participation in research. This event is an opportunity to share the findings and our recommendations and offer practical strategies and best practices to accelerate change towards gender equity. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes um, for those of you in the room. Accessible and non-gender specific bathrooms are located outside the room, um, just outside these two doors. In the event of a fire, you can use either the fire exit towards the back, my left, or the front here. Um, and assemble in the designated location, which is the domain. Please note that there is no hearing loop installed in this room. Following uh, the presentation by Dr. Isabel Kingsley and our panel discussion, we will open to questions from the audience. For those of you in the room, you can raise your hand and we'll come around with a roving mic. Um, and for those of you online, please use the chat function in Teams. We aim to create a respectful and considered atmosphere to have a discussion about gender equity in research and ask you to keep this in mind when asking your questions. And now to our opening remarks. It gives me extreme pleasure to welcome to the stage Janine Bredehoft, CEO, 
of SAGE. And joining us online is Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, Australian government's Women in STEM ambassador and professor in practice at UNSW Sydney. Please join us. Well, thank you everyone and good afternoon. Um, I'm Lisa Harvey-Smith and I'm joining you today from unceded Palawa country. Uh, the Palawa people are the traditional custodians of the land, the sea, the waterways, the skies, culture and language here in Lutrawita. And for those who can't see me, I have shoulder length brown hair, uh, I have light skin, and I'm wearing a t-shirt that says Deadly Science, which is a wonderful charity that we partner with. Now, five years ago, I became Australia's Women in STEM ambassador, which was a world's first. And the following year, um, we saw the launch of the Women in STEM decadal plan, which, of course, was led very ably by the two learned academies, the Academy of Science and the Academy of Technology and Engineering. We also saw a Women in STEM strategy from the government and a lot of a real raft of government investments. And this was really, uh, really what we needed. Uh, these investments have led to some remarkable progress since then. And between 2018 and 2021, we saw a 43% increase in the number of women working in STEM qualified industries. Now, we know that the barriers to individuals still persist. We haven't got there yet. And these barriers lurk within the very foundations of our institutions. So the fact is that programs focusing on the individuals uh, they won't shift these barriers and they're not enough, but changing how our institutions operate will. So to continue our progress, we need to remodel our universities, our research organizations, and all of our STEM workplaces. Uh, and we must reimagine the global research systems that reward competition over collaboration and that exclude those who are either unwilling or unable to work extremely long hours, to travel excessively, just as unspoken requirements of these jobs. We need to build new workplace norms. We need to build new attitudes and ways of working that are inclusive for all people. And this will take commitment. It will take leadership, good government, governance and accountability. And this accountability is sharpening, of course, with new laws coming into place very soon, like the positive duty to prevent workplace sexual harassment. And we must be guided by the evidence. And the research and insights presented today will illuminate the importance of fixing barriers to career progression that many women and others face. Thank you so much for being here and for engaging in this work. Your commitment is absolutely vital. And I hope you'll access our tools and resources uh, and our research on our website, womeninstem.org.au. Now I want to welcome my colleague, uh, Dr. Janine Fredhoved, who is the CEO of SAGE. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you everyone for being here today. I too, um, I'm Janine Bredhoved, the new CEO of SAGE. I have short hair, brown hair, and I'm wearing red round glasses and um, a jacket over my colored top. Um, yeah, thank you everyone for being here today. I want to give a specific shout out to um, Professor Nalini Joshi today, AO, who is here. Um, she's one of the founders of SAGE back in 2020, 2014, I think, um, or 15. So thank you so much for joining us today. Also, hello to everyone online. Um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you for um, the Women in STEM Ambassador um, team for putting together this work. And I'm really, um, it's really encouraging to see that we're moving on to doing so much work into this. SAGE has advocated for linking um, gender equality policies, practices, and outcome to funding um, since I've started in the uh, in the in the role, basically. So it's great to see some more work done in this space. Sage has always been working um, to improve diversity in STEM, and it has this is the core really that we're working on and that our subscribers are working towards. However, when I look at some data in 2014, there was 
there were the proportion of women in STEM was 26.5% uh, in the research higher education workforce. Today, that has increased to 29%. That is progress, but that is slow progress. So this means we really need to um, be moving faster on increasing this change. For me, this is indicative of women not being promoted or women leaving the STEM fields maybe to industry. It is indicative because we can see the data also shows us that on level A and B, the, women, the proportion of women is actually over 40%. However, when we go to the seniority, we can see a leaping pipeline there. This data will also be indicative of a higher gender pay gap in universities. Um, the W the Workplace Gender Equality Regulation that is coming in is means that from 2024 in February, gender pay gaps will be made public. We will see a proportion, a higher proportion of a, a greater gender pay gap um, through because of these inequalities in the workforce. So it's a time to reflect and it's a time for organizations to take accountability. Organizations through the new organization or through the new legislation also will and have to show um, and the benchmark reports that they will receive from the agency to their boards and to their senior executive. So there's a lot we can do to create workplaces where we all, and I mean everyone can thrive and where not only the majority that in the moment thrives can also, you know, we can broaden our um, workplaces to be inclusive for everyone in this space. So, and I'm sure, and I'm very delighted that today we will hear a lot about how we can create workplaces where people can thrive and where practices can be, how practices can be inclusive and um, how actions can actually um, mean that women feel supported and can be promoted and thrive. So thank you everyone for being here again. Thank you, Lisa and Janine uh, for these comments. Uh, to discuss the recently re released research that uh, they have alluded to on gender differences in funding outcomes, uh, I'd like to welcome Dr. Isabel Kingsley, Senior Research Associate and Lead Researcher on this project to the stage. Isabel. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. I am delighted to be here with you today to talk about our research. Now, for those of you who can't see me, I'm a woman with shoulder length blonde hair, uh, light skin, and I'm wearing a black jacket. Now, we conducted uh, this research uh, to bring some clarity into the mixed evidence that is out there about gender differences in research specifically in Australia and in the Australian government funded competitive research grants. And we wanted to bring that clarity because we want to inform efforts and we want to inf inform investment towards gender equity. So what we did, we uh, examined 20 years of awarded grants and funding amounts according to the gender of the lead investigator. Then we also explored if any gender differences that we found mirrored application rates and workforce participation rates by gender. Now, the awarded grants data set that we used had close to 47,000 awarded grants by the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council from 2000 to 2020. The data set included grants uh, to projects and fellowships and research centers. So basically all grants are in included in there. The data set did not include investigators self-identified gender. This information was not available publicly and the ARC and NHMRC were not able to share due to privacy concerns. So we inferred likely gender of each lead investigator as either woman or man based on their first name using a data-driven uh, gender inferencing algorithm that draws uh, from a very, very large international database. Now, I do want to acknowledge 
the limitations of inferring gender based on first names, including binarization of a non-binary construct of gender. And I also acknowledge any risks of misgendering investigators. We argue, however, that this method was suitable for the purpose of this specific research, which essentially examined potential bias and disparities stemming from the perceived gender of investigators by grant assessors. Now turning to application and workforce, we also incorporated grant application data from the ARC and NHMRC and research workforce data from the Excellence in, Austra in Research Australia exercise. And our modeling accounted for um, factors such as career seniority and um, field of research and the research intensity of the research organizations. So what did we find? This is where we get into the good stuff. We found that fewer awarded grants were led by women, but this reflected fewer women than men in the research workforce. Now I'm going to summarize the key findings of our study in five main points. So firstly, we found gender differences in awarded grants exist. This is true. Women led fewer grants than men, especially at senior career levels. But there's progress, which is nice to see. The percentage of women-led grants increased across all career levels between um, 2000 from 2000 to 2020. But as you can also see, the percentage of awarded grants led by women at each academic level is still well below gender parity. So we're making progress, but there's still lots of work to do. We also found that gender differences in awarded grants varied by field of research. So in fields like chemistry, maths, earth sciences, engineering, technology, physical sciences, women led about 15 to 16% of grants. In law and legal studies, for example, they had the highest uh, percentage of women like grants at 57%. So we found that field of research matters. Looking at success rates, well, we know that fewer women applied for grants, but success rates were roughly equivalent for women and men-led uh, men applications. Now, irrespective of gender, interestingly, success rates roughly halved for all researchers over the 20 year period of the study, um, and the degree of decline varied uh, by career seniority and gender, but success rates halved. Now, I do wanna bring in some, uh, some raw numbers here of applications by gender to illustrate the gender differences in applications. So as you can see here, the results suggest that Gender differences in awarded grants don't necessarily stem from gender differences in success rates. Fewer awarded grants were led by women because fewer awarded grant uh, because fewer grant applications were led by women. So awarded grants broadly mirror application rates. Now turning to funding amounts. We found that women-led grants were awarded the same amount of funding per grant as men-led grants. And this didn't differ according to academic level or career seniority or over time. Now, I do want to note um, over the 20 year period of the study, cumulative funds awarded to women-led grants were lower at 7.4 billion over the 20 years than the cumulative funds awarded to men-led grants, which was at 19 billion over the 20 years. But I want you to note that that is an outcome driven numerically by numerically fewer awarded grants being led by women than by men, not because women get less funding. Lastly, 
we'll look at award rates, which is the number of awarded grants relative to workforce participation. So there were fewer women in the research workforce, especially at senior levels, and interestingly, women's award rates, which again are the awarded grants relative to workforce participation, they were higher for women than for men, especially at senior career levels. Again, I'll bring in the raw numbers or the headcount for workforce participation by gender just to illustrate the gender differences in the workforce. So awarded grants broadly mirror workforce participation and favor women, especially at senior levels. So if we bring all of this together, we see that these pointings, these, these findings point to an issue that extends beyond granting systems. Fewer women in research means fewer women applicants, which likely results in fewer women receiving grants. And this pattern emerges despite an, um, uh, a disparity in award rates favoring women. So what do we do? How do we solve this? And that's what we're here to discuss today. We need to focus on attracting women into the workforce, but retaining them and progressing them. And how do we do that? As Lisa Harvey Smith said earlier, we need to focus on, we need to shift our focus from programs that focus on individuals to instead changing the foundations of our workplaces, of our institutions, remodel our workplaces, reimagine our research systems to accelerate that change towards gender equity. And I'm so excited to have that conversation about solutions today. Before we dive into the solutions, I want to acknowledge and thank the research team. Here they are, and they're all here today as well. Um, Dr. Eve Slavic, Professor Lisa Harvey-Smith, Professor Emma Johnston, and Associate Professor Lisa Williams. I also want to thank the Australian Research Council and the National Health and Medical Research Council for their support and for providing data that was not publicly available. And of course, I want to thank the Commonwealth Department of Industry, Science and Resources who fund the WISA initiative. Guests in the room, please make sure you bring um, your research brief with you when you go. And online guests, you can access that research uh, on our website. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel. Um, it is now my great pleasure to, inter to invite Professor Emma Johnston, AO, Deputy Vice Chancellor Research at the University of Sydney. Emma is a leading advocate for equity, diversity, and inclusion in the research sector, as well as herself being a fantastic researcher. To facilitate the discussion, I, I, we are joined by Ray Johnston a multi-award winning STEM journalist and broadcaster. So please join me in welcoming Emma and Ray to the stage. Thank you so much, Lisa. Just not sure I can be heard. Absolutely, fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much for your introduction. For those of you who can't see me, uh, I have brown shoulder length hair. I'm a light skinned Aboriginal woman. I'm a Wiradjuri woman. Uh, and I'm wearing fabulous earrings that have emu feathers on them from Gilawara Arts, which is a women-led uh, UN organisation down on the south coast of New South Wales. And I'm also wearing a fantastic pair of bright pink printed pants from another women-led Aboriginal fashion brand called Mirra. Uh, and I can provide you with links to those on my Instagram so that you can find them. But look, as, as someone who has worked in the science and technology journalism field for 12 years, I've been keeping a very close eye on where we're at with equality, with equity, both in gender and across all underrepresented people, really. So it's fantastic to be at a point where we're talking about solutions that have been implemented, that have made some genuine changes. So I'm very excited to be speaking with you today, Emma, about how you've 
actually gone about that? So I think I might kick off with that question. What have you done that has made an impact? Thank you very much. It's um, it's never a what have I done, it's a what have we done. Um, so I'll just reframe that question to begin <laughs> with. Um, and many of the people who I've worked with uh, throughout my career are actually in this room or probably online. So cheers to the team. Um, for those of you who can't see me, I am white and lots of freckles, um, always have. My hair went white early and I have a Mary Meko top on, which I'm pretty happy about. Um, <laughs> Not, not as fabulous as your pants, though. Thank They're you. Good. Uh, so what have I done? What have we done? Uh, look, as all of us know, it's a really complex issue when you're talking about something which is stemming from deep cultural differences um, or deep kind of cultural values, I guess, that have been with us for a long time. Um, and we, like, I never think of these issues as being one solution that's going to Rule, rule them all. Um, so what we did was basically when I became Dean of Science, and I've done this throughout my career in different roles, but I'll use the Dean of Science role as an example, is worked um, from the grassroots up and from the top down. So I was Dean of Science. I was able to use my leadership position, that structural power that comes with that role, um, the leadership of the University of New South Wales at the time, which was aligned and the energy and ideas and know-how of the grassroots um, activities to pull together a suite of initiatives and um, cultural change actions that covered absolutely every point uh, of the problem, as far as we could tell. So the issue was when I came into the role, we had uh, we're a science faculty um, traditionally, the pipeline of women into a lot of these disciplines, particularly chemistry, mathematics and physics, uh, is very low from the beginning. So we've got an issue starting right from primary school and high school. Um, and then the recruitment and retention was such that at by the time you got to level associate level D and E, so associate professor and professor, we were sitting at about 16, 17%. Um, after might I say, and might I recognise decades and decades of advocacy and action um, to try and uh, solve that problem. And as an example, when I was first recruited into the University of New South Wales um, as an associate lecturer, so right at the, the bottom of the rung, um, I was recruited into a school of 30 in biological earth and environmental sciences, 30 continuing academics, and I was the only woman. Uh, and that was in early 2000s. Yeah, it's crazy. So I, I really knew that the argument that trickle down was going to solve the problem. It was just a matter of time before it was all fixed. It's not true. So what did we do? So from the grassroots, um, so I've, I've always been an advocate and um, an activist in this space and other spaces. Um, we got a working group together in the Dean. I didn't have any resources for this at, to begin with. So we, we gathered together a representative from each of the schools of the faculty to form a working group. These are willing, you know, active participants. I ensured that the heads of school gave them um, a proportion, an acknowledgement of the time that they were committing to that. And um, we worked together to formulate a work plan. What ended up happening, which was really important and, and very much not, you know, my master plan, but something I hoped would happen was that each of those um, working school representatives, most of them ended up starting their own equity, diversity and inclusion working group in their own schools. And so a lot of the grassroots energy and a lot of the actual cultural change and engagement and, and activities were happening right there. Um, and that kind of fed ideas up to us in the university-wide group. In the university-wide group, we tackled every part of the pipeline as far as we could tell. So we reviewed all the policies and processes for recruitment and for promotion. And just to give you some, like this is a lot of work, but it, you know, when you break it down and you call it a working group, not a biscuit committee, things get done. And so we had, for example, in recruitment, as the Dean of Science, well, we changed the policy and then I would not let an interview go ahead unless there are at least 40% competitive women at the shortlist stage. So I actually stopped recruitment processes um, in some schools. And I said, nope, 
go back, re-advertise. We changed the wording of those advertisements so they were gender neutral. Um, we we distributed uh, those advertisements through networks that we knew had a lot of women engaged. Professional bodies play a really important role in um, advancing gender equity. They can do a lot within their own professional organisation, but they also disseminate and promote and tap people on the shoulder. So once the heads of school got to know that I was serious about this and that that started working its own magic and all of a sudden you would hear things like, you wouldn't believe the number of women we had applying for this position. <laughs> like, yes, I would believe it. But um, we had that happening. So that, that was recruitment. In promotions, I literally, um, again, evidence-informed approach. I had the data on almost all of the, the academics in the university and in the schools. And I could see who was performing really well on a number of different metrics. I would also would talk to the heads of school and say, which women do you think of maybe holding back a bit, maybe should be applying for promotion, but haven't quite yet done that. And then I would either ask the head of school or I would do it myself and go and have a conversation with that person and say, why, you know, how are you thinking about promotion? And what we found was we flushed out all of these women who just hadn't had the confidence in part because the role models weren't there, they weren't being encouraged to apply, they weren't going to apply until they were 150% sure that they would get promoted. And all of a sudden the panels for promotion that I would be sitting on interviewing uh, these applicants, we would regularly be saying to ourselves, why didn't this person apply three years earlier? And we basically, within a really short amount of time, were able to... Um, appropriately promote a whole lot of people who had been stuck in the system or not confident to apply. For others, um, we also set up more structured processes, the Ch Women in Champions or Women in Maths and Science Champions program, which was for early career researchers and for PhDs. And for those, we, um, we ran deliberate profile building activities, confidence building activities, speaking um, activities, leadership programs. And we critically, we asked them to go and practice their new skills and build their profile in high schools. Um, and this was deliberately aimed at then kind of completing the circle where our high school students, particularly year nines and 10 girls, would see uh, active, um, engaged, confident women in STEM uh, who could then help bring that pipeline back through. So I I could go on for another half an hour. So I'm going to stop. No, it's That's fantastic a, to hear, honestly. It's a few of the things that we did, yeah. It's been a lot of work involved in that so who when you're saying we mm. who does we entail because often historically it's the people that are needing the help that are putting in the work mm. to make the change is that the case here yeah look in some cases you need that to happen because it's a visibility issue and you do need women to be visible and also to be participating in panels and decision making before you can actually get the change happening. And when you don't have parity in your, in your population, that means over-representation and overwork. So what we tried to do, or what I tried to do in each of those cases was make sure that those people were appropriately recognised for that work, usually with you know, a relief from some other activity. It's not always easy to do. You do find that there is an additional burden that people take on um, that is very difficult to compensate for. The other approach, of course, is to make it the responsibility of whoever is in the leadership role. Um, so KPIs for the deans, expectations um, of the faculty, expectations of um, my HR staff, the recruitment staff. So putting the workload back to implement the policies takes away a lot of the actual volunteer work um, because it becomes part of your, your actually daily job of implementing gender equity um, reforms. We did actually recruit as well. So we have a wonderful Associate Dean Research, which was Lisa, which was the first, you were my first. So I created the Associate Dean Equity, Diversity and Inclusion role and Lisa um, was the first person into that role and remains in that role now, which is fantastic. Retention. And so Lisa did most of the work, um, but it was actually a position, right? It was a fractional position um, and it carried more weight that way, but it also had created space for Lisa to work on it and others. Within that, we we hire, I hired professional staff. So we had in the end two or three, yeah, depending on the period of time, whose whole role was to support the initiatives of the equity and diversity inclusion working group. 
So that might have been engagement activity. You know, we had a calendar of events, um, all that sort. So, that, so we basically resourced it. And then we created space for the rest of our professional staff within their workloads to actually engage in those activities as well. Nice. Mm -hmm. So we will have time for audience questions. Before we do throw to those, though, with the context of what we're speaking about today, what role have you seen research funding play as a mechanism towards gender equity? So research funding is um, obviously empowering because it builds capacity for anyone who gets it to conduct, conduct their research. Most people in a continuing position have 40% of their time allocated to research. But if you're only doing it by yourself, um, it, it can be really quite hard to get a lot done. Research, um, depending on the discipline, is not usually a solo activity. You know, it's usually a team effort. And you can have collaborators, but it's often students and students need resources it's um, research assistants and it's a lot of costly work, particularly in the STEM disciplines. So it's absolutely an enabler. It's also a, a prestige factor, which then allows you to do other things like get um, promoted, for example, or actually get visibility in the media, for example. You can get prizes based on how much grants are awarded. So it's a virtuous circle that you get into when you get research grant awards. And the good news about this project that we were, we've been engaged on for some time now doing this really complicated analysis and huge shout out to Eve Slavich, who's in the room, who led on the statistics, um, is that we didn't detect very, um, significant biases in the assessment of grants um, and the award of grants. So the percentage of grants going is pretty proportional to the percentage that people are applying for, which means kudos to the ARC and the NH and MRC for um, making that happen. And it also means that one of the barriers is, you know, mostly out of the way. It's not, I wouldn't say it's entirely out of the way, but one of the barriers is mostly out of the way, which is how grants are reviewed. And, you know, a lot of work has been done by those review panels to build up the capacity to, to assess track record relative to opportunity, et cetera. What it does focus the mind on is the other aspects are actually more difficult to fix, which is how do you get um, equal recruitment, not only in, you know, um, just across the board, but particularly into those disciplines where the pipeline is actually much lower than 40%. So coming into chemistry, maths and physics, you'll find that we get about 20% women into that. And actually at the University of New South Wales, which I can speak to more clearly, there was still about 20% right the way through the pipeline. So they're actually much better, those disciplines, at retaining the people that they had recruited to begin with. But the pipeline was always that small. So different parts of the pipeline leak depending on the discipline that you're working with. And if you look at the grant differences, 19 billion versus 7.4 billion over, over that period, that's not just about not having enough women overall. That's also having women concentrated in, in research fields that where there isn't much funding. Okay, not, not just because the research costs more, but because Australia as a, sec, as a, in a kind of government um, has decided that it will heavily weight funding towards health and medical research. And over the last 10 years, we've seen a doubling of the amount of health and medical research, whereas a flatlining of the research for grants available in terms of competitive grants um, for every other discipline. So increasingly, if you're not in medical and health research, um, you know, that's not where the fun, you, there isn't much funding. If you look at the humanities per se, it's estimated that there's approximately 10% of competitive grant funding available to all of the humanities. And that's where you'll find concentrations of women. Um, and this is a pattern that you see across other sectors, you know, wherever there's a concentration of women, there's a, a lower wage. Um, and when that concentration changes, for example, there's some historical data around com computing. Com computing was originally very female dominated and it was very poorly paid. And as it became more male dominated, it became really highly paid. Funny that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's it's partly about, okay, well, aren't the humanities really important as well? Doesn't it cost money to actually do humanities research? Um, so we've got some work to do balancing out research funding priorities, um, but also recruiting 
more men into the humanities, more women into the STEM disciplines. Fantastic. It is now time for audience questions. So for those of you who are physically here, please raise your hand. We do have roving mics heading around and I do believe that Lisa is representing those tuning in from home who are popping questions into teams and we will alternate between you. So Lisa, do, do you have someone? I do. Yep, checking, there we go. Um, so I have two questions here and I'm gonna reword to, to ask you a two part question, Emma. Uh, so the first part of the question is um, with all these fantastic initiatives that you undertook, particularly as Dean of Science at UNSW, um, how did you source the funding to do that? And the second part of the question, perhaps related, uh, did you get any pushback? And what reasons were given to you for not implementing the change that you wanted to see? Great questions, Lisa. I mean, in part, I answered that before in relation to, um, you know, having positions that were structurally, I created positions that were structurally um, part of my core funding as the Dean of Science. So it was a decision that I was enabled to make within the power of that structural role. Not everyone has structural power. Some people only have influential power, so it, it becomes harder. So I took great advantage of that. Um, and in part, it was also the schools uh, came forward with their own support for these programs. Once it was clear, by the way, you know, stepping back, I really built this into the strategy for the science faculty. This was part of everyone buying into um, an, a, an in equity and inclusion program. So then money started to flow a little bit from that part of it. Um, the university as a whole was on a, was on a real strategic um, push to increase equity, diversity and inclusion as well. So they created a new Deputy Vice-Chancellor EDI, which really helped um, and put some pressure on. And then finally, in terms of pushback, when you have the leadership messaging strategy aligned with the actions, you don't get as much resistance, but there was still resistance. And I can um, think of one particular matter which is really important for us to have conversations about and to really um, delve into is that when I was interested in creating uh, women only roles in some of the fields of research where we had like zero professors, um, I got pushback from other women in those fields uh, who were employees. And that's because they felt that by advertising a woman only position, it would um, reflect poorly on them and that people would think that they only got the role because they were a woman. Um, and these were existing staff who legitimately got through all of the hurdles to get a continuing position. Um, and it's really interesting because I, I had to have a lot of conversations with people to say, well, all of the blokes got their roles in a situation in which there was bias towards them. Why would you not try and balance that out? Um, and it's not something that's easy to explain because none of that bias is documented per se. You know, a lot of it is just historical or cultural or unspoken, even un, un, like misunderstood what we call unconscious bias, with, which our psychologists like to call implicit bias, because you can't have a bias if you're unconscious. So just, just putting it out there that we have to use the word implicit bias. When you have a whole school of psychologists, you get told. Um, so, you know, a lot of that is playing into these decisions. They're, they're not highly visible. Um, and so that was a really interesting bit of resistance. I, in the end, didn't create those roles and didn't advertise those roles. So it wasn't a barrier that I got over. I got around it through creating um, recruitment practices and processes that were um, structured so that we incentivized the recruitment of women and um, it didn't have to be uh, forced, basically. Um, what we did do, though, and I'm continuing a lot of these act activities at the University of Sydney, by the way, so we've just run a, a substantial fellowship scheme for 40 new academic roles um, in climate, health and sustainability. And I made it a rule of that, that over the whole of those 40, at least 20 will be women. And I also have made them continuing positions. And this is really important. So they're early mid-career academic roles. Often these are advertised as five-year fellowships and that's it. And this is really, really part of the reason why we lose women um, in those early pipeline leakage issues is because women say, well, I need to go off and have a 
baby or I need to take a substantial amount of time out of my career for one reason or the other, um, or I can't afford to move from postdoc to postdoc to postdoc to postdoc to postdoc before I get my continuing position. And so we lose them into other careers. Um, so create, I've deliberately made them continuing roles and we attracted the most spectacular set of candidates and we're just about to, I mean, we're negotiating with the top 40 at the moment. And I've structured it in a way, so this is a grassroots recruitment program across the whole university, but I've structured it in a way that there is no way, there's no loophole that we will ever, ever end up with less than 50% women in those fellowship roles. Great. Yeah. Well done. For the audience. We have an audience question. Yes, we have a raised hand. Yours. Oh, okay. Hi, um, um, thank you. Oh, oh, oh we're two at once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in the pink first. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was really interested in the point you made, um, Emma, about having KPIs for deans. So I was wondering what that looked like operationally because I think that's a fundamental thing that needs to be changed. We can't rely on people like you who are to the goodness of your heart to do the thing that's right. So what did that KPI for a dean look like to improve gender equity? Yeah, so uh, we've just introduced them, by the way, at the University of Sydney, the provost has worked with the deans to set KPIs for the first time um, for gender equity. And it is... It, it's done in discipline specific or faculty specific. So depending on what the background um, level of women is and what the recruitment rates are, you can, and what attrition rates are and retirement rates are, you can pretty easily calculate how quickly you can change that metric and you can set realistic but ambitious targets. So that's, a, that's an actual target for um, the percent of women at each level. And what, um, what as a KPI, if you want to know how that works, it's pretty much associated with the bonus component of the dean's personal wage. <laughs> so usually that's what KPIs reflect. And um, so that actually means that you've got an incentivized leader that then trickles down. The leader then sets KPIs for each of the schools, for example, if that's how they want to do it. They can then also be more discipline specific because you get um, quite different quite large differences. So for example, School of Psychology might already have 60% women, um, but not enough women at leadership. So you're setting quite specific granular KPIs within that. Um, School of Physics might have 14% all the way through. So you're trying to build a bigger pipeline at the beginning. Yeah. Fantastic. Now we've got this question over here. Hi. Um, so it's really great to hear this talk. And, and I'm particularly interested in the um, results of the the, the research that you did, which showed that it's about retention, progress and entry for women in the pipeline. Um, this sort of goes with a lot of the research in the literature, which says that there's a, one of the most critical points is when women leave sort of uh, you know, the undergraduate, their postgraduate studies and go into the workforce. That's a critical dropping off point, not just for women, but other underrepresented groups in STEM. Um, I'm really interested to hear the panel's opinions on what we can do and specifically for I guess, STEM employing organisations as well as um, the funders for STEM. What are some? What, what do you think are some of the big things that they could do, what you'd like to see? Um, yeah, so we broaden it outside of the university sector. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So interesting thing in relation to, for example, um, how many women we are now training as engineers versus how many um, are in the workforce. It's quite a large discrepancy there. Um, so we're successfully attracting and recruiting women into engineering degrees at a much higher rate than we have before. Some universities more than others, but we're often getting up to, say, 26% in some of the GO8 universities. Um, participation in the workforce, about 11%. And so you can really see there that there is a structural and or cultural problem that is meaning that women who are trained up and available and by gosh, Australia needs engineers, right? We are so short of engineers. We've got this cohort of them we know are highly trained but are not participating. It means those um, STEM sectors need to think really hard about how do they make their workforce more attractive to be a part of. And in small and medium enterprises, there's particular challenges. And Australia's economy is built on a lot of small and medium enterprises because the general understanding is that once you get to about 40%, 30 or 40% um, women or any minority group, 
the whole culture starts to change. It starts to be more in, inviting. It starts to be more accepting and easier to work in. Um, but if you're a small and medium enterprise with 20, 20 engineers and you've already got 20 male engineers, then it's quite hard to transition. Like if you recruit one person at a time, yeah. it's really hard for that individual. Um, so I think a lot of focus and work could be put into that as a how do we make it more attractive? How do we network women beyond the SME that they're part of so that they feel supported beyond their own um, organisation? Um, how do we network the leaders of the SMEs, the, the CEOs and the directors to ensure that they're all feeling like they are a champion and that they can make this difference even if it's, if it's one step at a time? And, of course, um, you know, structural reforms that, in, that ensure that there's generous parental leave uh, in all of those sectors and that there are... Um, there are not penalties for having gaps in your in your career. I think, you know, a lot of this, like I've said this a few times, a lot of this is not rocket science. You know, we actually have the policies, techniques, processes. Um, you know, you could look them up on the web. The European Union has it all written out. You know, these are these are understood techniques. It's about putting them all into place in an ecosystem almost all at once so that they work um together rather than what we, we tend to do, which is to take one step at a time and find the resistance or the barriers in the other parts of the system are enough to you know push us back to square one. Okay. Unfortunately, that is all that we have time for. for this. I make my answers really long and then I don't get too many tricky questions. That's because you have so much knowledge. You're very good at answering them. Please join me in thanking Professor Emma Johnston. Thank you. All right, um, I will keep my, my concluding remarks quite brief. Um, today, we've heard about some uh, really insightful research about how funding can play a part in the gender equity ecosystem in research, in higher education and research institutions, and heard some great insights from Professor Emma Johnston on what we can practically do uh, to change this scene and to innovate and accelerate, as Janine called for. Accelerating change is really the key message here. Uh, we hope that you leave here feeling empowered uh, to engage more deeply in the actions you can do uh, to accelerate that change. Continue the conversation today with your peers and colleagues at your workplaces online. If you're on socials, we have a hashtag here um, that you can use. And it, we invite you to make a public commitment to what you might do by using the additional hashtag commit to equity. For those of you joining online, you'll see a link to an evaluation link, uh, and thank you for doing that. And for those of you here today, you'll receive that evaluation link via email, and we thank you very much. We're very keen on evaluation in this group uh, for completing that. It'll help us inform our actions in the future. Uh, the web has a, a ton of information, but in particular, I'd like to invite you to the Women in STEM uh, ambassador website, as well as the SAGE website for fantastic things that you might do. Um, for those of you here today, I'll enjoy, I'll invite you to join us for tea and coffee in the foyer. And that concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs>